Okay. All right. <coughs> so uh, yesterday I tried to argue that. So I tried to argue that it was reasonable to uh, think that the information paradox is solved uh, by non-perturbative effects in effective field theory, with respect to effective field theory, namely effects of order e to the minus 1 over the effective expansion parameter, where the effective expansion parameter is Newton constant in units of the uh, natural energy scale of the problem uh, of the black hole background. This quantity is also the order of e to the minus s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. And this is also uh, the same as uh, the scale of the discreteness of the spectrum over the temperature if we are looking at the band of states. which is a width t and which is around the average energy, which is the average energy of your state. Okay, so you think of a state which is spread uh, over some region in the spectrum. It could be a mixed state, could be a density matrix, could be a pure state. Okay, but uh, you imagine that this is a state which is spread roughly uh, with this width uh, over some band of states. And then uh, e to the minus s measures the uh, scale of discreteness of the energy and therefore it is related to a time scale called the Heisenberg time scale which is uh, of the order of t minus 1 e to the s and you can also consider the Poincaré time scale which is a further t to the minus 1 e to the e to the s log 1 over epsilon which has the interpretation that physical properties become quasi-periodic with precision epsilon that you give a priori after uh, roughly this time scale, which is a really gigantic time scale. Okay? So uh, in order to exhibit these time scales and therefore to exhibit in the <coughs> time dependence of physical quantities these effects, the effects of the discretum of the energy levels, uh, you need to keep the black hole from operating. So you have, to, you have to put the black hole in a box and leave it there. Uh, so working basically with eternal black holes. And then the question is if there is a, a subtlety in the treatment of ADS-CFT, usual treatment of the rules of ADS-CFT, which highlights this fact, okay? Uh, for black holes that are caged in ADS and therefore do not evaporate. And this uh, was uh, the proposal of Maldacena uh, in the early, I don't remember exactly, the early 2000s, where he considered the following situation. He noticed that uh, if you consider correlation functions in ADS of operators that are separated by some large time, and you do the computation in the background uh, of the black hole using the standard rules of uh, calculation of these objects, what you find is that if your operator is called B, BT, B0, in the background of the black hole, would scale like e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is a further t. Okay? So this is a quasi normal behavior. So when t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And therefore, this contribution to the answer, to the correlation function, fails completely to show, for example, Poincaré recurrences. Okay? There is no quasi-periodicity, there is nothing. Yeah? The calculation is done between Newton goes to zero, then? Yeah. Okay, so, at the same time, uh, he considered the situation where, uh, if you think of it, uh, coming from the Euclidean path integral computation of these things, this correlation function uh, is obtained by analytically continuing a correlation function in the Euclidean black hole geometry. And then you can consider other contributions coming from other topologies, like for example, 
the uh, thermal ADS geometry, which is just ADS uh, with uh, time identified on a circle. And then in this case, you get zero for the limit when t goes to infinity from this part. From, from this part, you get something that is suppressed. It's not zero, but it's suppressed by uh, the difference in uh, <coughs> Euclidean actions between these two backgrounds. Okay, so this is something which is a further e to the minus n star, where n star is the number of the use of freedom in the CFT, so n squared for superior meals, etc. So uh, this is very nice because this is like uh, uh, showing uh, exactly what you want, to, what you mean by saying that uh, uh, there are effects that have to do with uh, how the black hole preserves the information that can only be seen when uh, you consider non-perturbative corrections. Okay. Non-perturbative corrections. Like, for example, this one. This is a non-perturbative correction in effective field theory because... Sorry? Ah, uh, well, since this is the Euclidean action of gravity, it is inversely proportional to Newton. So this quantity is e to the minus a constant of the lambda effective. So this is just uh, the kind of effect that we were discussing yesterday heuristically. Okay, okay so... What I'm going to do in this, uh, in this talk today is to uh, go back to this problem a little bit and uh, drawing on some general considerations uh, similar to the ones that uh, uh, were uh, referred to uh, this morning by Douglas, uh, do some simple estimates of how much you expect for the noise or for the long time uh, value of the correlation function coming from states of black hole type and states of this type, right? Which should both contribute uh, to the complete expression of the correlation function in the CFT, okay? So the idea is that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, you have a, a picture for the density of the states of the CFT. So this is roughly the entropy, okay? <coughs> and in holographic CFTs, you have these exotic bands of states this one is the one that you associate to large ADS black holes, which is exotic from the point of view of the bulk, but it's completely normal from the point of view of the CFT. It's just the standard high energy states of the CFT. These are small black holes. And this is, uh, say, graviton states in ADS. Okay. So you have all these bands and you have more, in general, more bands, but uh, I just want to highlight uh, qualitatively uh, that you have this, this kind of situation. And then the question is that uh, you would like to associate this band with this computation and that band with that computation. Okay? And uh, the gravity computation as it comes from the rules uh, of the book gives a correlation function that has no long-term features at all, it decays exponentially if you calculate here. But you may wonder uh, if you just estimate that in the CFT uh, using some general arguments, what is the answer? And how does it compare to the answer you get here? Okay, is it larger, is it smaller? Is it of the same order of magnitude? What is it? Okay. All right, so in order to do that, I will first remind you of why do you get a zero here, right? Uh, it's just a very simple thing, which can be exhibited uh, just geometrically. And it highlights why it is actually very robust and very difficult to get rid of if you use uh, the rules of effective field theory. So you have the Euclidean manifold. Okay, this manifold is just ds squared equal d tau squared f of r plus dr squared over f of r plus r squared d omega d minus 1 squared, where tau is identified with period beta, and uh, beta is equal to 2 pi over kappa, where kappa was this relaxation uh, scale that I mentioned yesterday, which you can define just by doing the Taylor expansion of f around the horizon. Now, you want to calculate this for operators that are uh, put there on the boundary, 
but uh, it is actually much easier to do the argument if you think of operators that are put here near the tip of the uh, the tip of the cigar. Okay. From the point of view of the CFT, those operators are pretty non-local operators in space, right? And uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, of the bulk, they are operators that are sitting very near the horizon. So in the picture that I just erased, they are operators that are just uh, evaluated very close to the horizon in the so-called Rindler region. Uh, before I, I, I tell you this, I should emphasize that there is nothing pathological, okay, it's very important that there is nothing pathological in having a correlation function that goes like this. Okay, in a quantum field theory. There is no breakdown of unitarity or anything like that. There is no problem with that, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, this is the normal thing if you have a quantum field theory in infinite volume, okay? Any quantum field theory in infinite volume will have this type of behavior typically. For example, if this is the density, for example, of a conserved quantity, and this is a density-density correlation, conserved quantities will typically diffuse, right? So if you have diffusion, means that uh, you have some conserved quantity that you can picture in terms of a quasi-particle of some kind, and this thing will just diffuse in random walks, okay? And then the correlation function will be basically the inverse of the size of the random walk. And the size of the random walk is the square root of t after time t. So this thing will go like 1 over uh, square root of t to the number of dimensions, so uh, d minus 1 special dimensions in d, the space-time dimensions, okay? And it will go to zero, like a power. You can also get uh, the quasi-normal behavior rigorously, for example, if you have a one plus one dimensional conformity theory. In a one plus one dimensional conformity theory on a line, in an infinite line, you can prove rigorously for uh, simple operators, scalar operators, uh, you can prove rigorously this uh, asymptotics. So it's nothing out of the ordinary, okay? What is special is that in any quantum field theory, when you put the system in a box so that you discretize the spectrum, then uh, this cannot happen. Okay? Because, for example, you will have Poincaré recurrences, and the Poincaré recurrences are incompatible with this law. And what is funny is that the black hole now is in a box, and still uh, we have uh, this behavior. Okay? So why is this happening to us? And this is what I'm going to explain now. So let's suppose that the operators are here near the tip of the cigar. So in that region, you have uh, a good approximation of this thing by the terms, in terms of a disk. So this is like a flat disk. And then I have here an operator at uh, angle zero and at uh, time Euclidean time tau there. And it is a distance rho from the horizon, where rho is the uh, proper distance from the horizon. Now, at zero distances, I know how this correlation function uh, behaves. So this is phi of tau, phi of zero. This will look, uh, the Euclidean correlation function will go like the distance between these two points to the power d minus one. Say, for example, for a uh, free scalar field in d plus one dimensions, because we are in ADS d plus one. And this distance is very simple to calculate, right? This distance is just, it's essentially twice uh, rho sine of the corresponding uh, angle, which is just uh, pi tau over beta, okay? So that's, that's how the distance uh, scales. And therefore, uh, after analytic continuation to Lorentzian time, so if I now do the analytic continuation, what happens is that this, this sign goes into hyperbolic sign. And then from here, what you get is that this correlation, this correlation in real time now, in this backflow background, will go like e to the minus phi d minus 1 over beta times t, okay? 
Now, uh, there is a funny thing uh, going on with these calculations, which is just the fact that the same disk, the same cigar, has two different analytic continuations that are relevant or that uh, can be considered. Okay? Uh, if I give you the cigar in polar coordinates and I do analytic continuation in the polar angle, I get this. Right? And uh, in real time, what I get is I have the black hole horizon here and I get a correlation between two points that are staying at fixed distance from the horizon. So in the Penrose diagram, I am getting something which corresponds to an operator here and an operator here, okay? in that side of the, uh, of the uh, black hole. And there is no mention at all of the other side of the black hole. Okay? On the other hand, if I coordinate this disk in Cartesian coordinates, so if I consider Px, right, then the relation between the Cartesian coordinates and the coordinates, uh, the Rinder coordinates, which are associated to this time variable here, is, as you know, x plus minus t equals rho e to the plus minus kappa t. Okay? And then something peculiar happens. If I give you this expression and I take t to t plus or minus i beta halves, remember that uh, kappa is equal to pi over beta, then uh, with this continuation, what I do is I send xt to minus xt. So I can invert any point uh, in this diagram by doing this analytic continuation. That means that uh, if I know the correlation function on the right-hand side, I know the correlation function also uh, basically everywhere. Right? This is kind of a baby version of black hole complementarity. All the information in correlation functions everywhere is contained in the information of correlation functions here. Okay? by analytic continuation. And then, from this point of view, the fact that this thing is going to zero as a dual interpretation, as the fact that uh, in these coordinates, in these Tx coordinates, uh, you have this line here. So I have an operator here, an operator there. Okay. And then, uh, let's say I'm going to do something different. I will, I will put an operator there, an operator in the inverted time minus t here. Okay. Then, if I know this correlator by doing uh, analytic continuation in this variable, I can uh, send this point there. Okay. And therefore, the fact that this correlator is going down exponentially is associated to the fact that this correlator is going down exponentially at these two points are separating, okay? So that means that uh, from the fact that correlation functions at t and minus t on one side go to zero, I can deduce that correlation functions on both sides, when both times go to infinity, are also going to zero in the same manner, okay? These correlation functions are called usually or sometimes EPR correlators because they involve two asymptotic boundaries and therefore they involve two CFTs in the dual interpretation. Right? And these correlation functions are standard thermal correlation functions because they, everything is occurring on this side. So for all purposes, you can trace over the other side and you get a density matrix, which is just thermal correlation function. Okay? Yes. Uh, well, if I stick to the operators which are local in the bulk, like in this argument I'm doing here, I would have to worry about that at some point. But uh, I only wanted to illustrate where the exponential behavior comes from. Ultimately, you want to put the operators to the boundary, and then uh, that defines according to the usual ADCFT rules an honest local operator in the CFT without any gravitational density uh, dressing when you put it to the boundary. Okay? So, I just want to illustrate that uh, despite the fact that I gave you an argument only when the operators are close to the horizon, 
it is more or less clear that when you p separate them, the thing is going to get worse. You know, the correlation is going to be smaller. So uh, it's not going to be uh, start uh, having an interesting behavior at, at time infinity uh, because you're taking it to the boundary. Okay. So that was the idea of the argument. Yes. So this, this uh, the symmetry of It is a symmetry of ordinary thermal systems. Uh, in the following sense, I will, I can actually say that now. Okay. Now, the CFT interpretation of this thing is the following. Yes. You said uh, in this one asymptotic region, you get the correlators everywhere throughout the Penrose diagram. It doesn't look to me like you get them inside the future or past uh, singularity region. Uh, sorry, that's not the correct name. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I say they go, but uh, you have to start from the Euclidean cigar. The Euclidean cigar, okay, when you represent it in Kruskal coordinates, uh, <coughs> when you rotate back in Kruskal coordinates, you get anywhere in the Penrose diagram. Okay, so uh, what is not uh, mapped is the Lorentzian position of the operator to the Lorentzian position of the operator in the, in the interior of the black hole. In order to get that, I mean, what you can do is to send uh, a Lorentzian operator in the future interior to one in the future past. That you can do, right? But uh, still, the information that, uh, uh, I mean, all the information is Euclidean correlator, in a sense, okay? Because it's the mother of all the continuations, and you have several analytic continuations, okay? So if you say that you start life with this object, this object contains everything, as far as correlation functions in the black hole background. Okay. So I'm going to raise this. So that picture there, I will draw it again, with the operator in minus t and other in t, this is interpreted in the CFT as the trace over the uh, thermal density matrix of the operator B of T, B minus T. Okay? And uh, this thing here, where you have both operators here, gets interpreted as the expectation value in the so-called thermophile double state of an operator at T on the left CFT, an operator B on the right CFT. This is the Alice T CFT, this is the Bob CFT. Where TFD is the standard thing that you know about. Where these are in states of the Hamiltonian of the CFT, so you have two copies of the same CFT, and you take a basis, which is the product basis of eigenstates on both sides, where m bar is the CPT conjugate on the left side. Okay, this is a technicality, uh, which is important for what I'm going to say right now. So, if you just consider general operators here with some matrix elements that are totally general, Hermitian operators, you can check that this definition of the state is such that uh, the analytic continuation works, okay, in general. Where rho of beta is, of course, the standard e to the minus h over z, okay, the standard canonical density matrix. So what happens is that uh, the uh, thermophile double correlation function, so the EPR correlator, can be written as trace rho beta b of t a of minus t plus i beta halves. Okay? And you can check that if you just substitute this there, you can rewrite it in this form. Okay? It's just a simple exercise. And uh, the fact that you get here the CPT conjugates is there in order to uh, transpose the indices of the A operator which you need to transpose in order to pass it to the other side and interpret it as an operator on the other side. Okay? The point is that if it is a Hermitian operator, the transposition is the same as complex conjugation. 
of the matrix elements. And complex conjugation of the matrix elements is what you get when you evaluate it in this CPT conjugate uh, eigenstates. Okay? So, in a sense, the definition of the thermophile double state is tailored for this analytic continuation to work. Okay? But that means that any conclusion that you get now also in the CFT about the long time behavior of a thermal correlation function can be transported immediately to a conclusion about EPR correlators. So correlations and long time between two sites, two uncoupled CFTs, okay? No, no. Uh, to get correlation, you don't need to have causal contact. Uh, of course, I'm not telling you how I'm preparing this state. Okay, this state has entanglement. Okay, it's very hard to prepare that state. But you know that happens every time in quantum field theory. The correlations at fixed time uh, are non-zero because the vacuum is entangled. Okay, so correlation doesn't mean causation. Okay, it's the usual thing. All right, so. Let me see uh, if I'm lost already. Okay, so what is the physical interpretation of this result? So why is this happening to us? Right? Uh, the physical interpretation is that uh, somehow the, quantum, the, the black hole, the presence of the black hole inside the box makes the spectrum continuous despite the fact that the ADS is a good box. I was telling you the idea that ADS is a perfect box, okay? And indeed, if I put a quantum field in ADS and I just uh, calculate the spectrum of energy levels, I get a discrete spectrum. However, if there is a black hole there and I treat it according to this uh, standard formalism, I get a continuous spectrum. So that can also be seen directly uh, by analyzing the... Uh, the spectrum of a quantum field in the background of black hole in real time. So let's say that I give you the following equation. So I have a free field, right, in ADS. This is happening in ADS. And uh, I write, I look for solutions which are of the form 1 over R, D minus 1 over 2, some radial component, some harmonical component for the angles, uh, and some well-defined frequency component. I put it through this equation, uh, and then I get a, an effective equation for the radial wave function, f of r, which uh, looks nice if you change variables to the so-called... Uh, Reggie Wheeler coordinate, which is dr square, dr star equal dr over f of r. So this is called the tortoise coordinate. And what is nice about this coordinate is that now this equation, in terms of this part, which is the non-trivial one, can be written in this form as a Schrodinger problem with some effective potential. And the solutions of this Schrodinger problem determine the spectrum of eigenfrequencies of this field. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. R. You have to specify the boundary conditions to get the spectrum, right? I'm going to I'm going to look for real solutions, which can be ingoing or outgoing. I don't care. Just real solutions the real frequencies of the, of the problem. I diagonalize the Hamiltonian, okay? The real spectrum. Um, so I, I missed, where do we see that we're, that we're the spectrum? Where we see? That we have a continuous spectrum. Is that uh, that's what I'm explaining now. Well, you said, now you're going to show it um, just by solving the equation, but you said just the fact that we have a thermal state means that it's a continuous spectrum. You said that's a continuous spectrum. Did I say that? <laughs> no, no, um, there what you get is an answer for the correlator, right? And uh, somehow uh, it has to be happening that the spectrum got continuous.
because if it was a box, you wouldn't get uh, that exponential tail okay, on general grams. Right? So I'm now showing that the spectrum gets continuum. No, in a thermal system, you don't get a spect continuous spectrum. If the system is in a box, spectrum is discrete. You know, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are discrete. I'm just showing, the, uh, showing that in the approximation where the background contains a black hole and is treated as a fixed background, the quantum field theory will have a continuous spectrum despite the fact that there is a box. Okay? So, uh, So now, very simply, we can see that uh, how does the tortoise coordinate look for the case of this black hole? Okay. So when r goes to infinity, which is where the box is, uh, f of r goes like r squared over l squared. This is how it goes in anti sitter And then uh, r star goes like the integral of uh, dr over r squared, which is co which is finite integrable at infinity, which means that uh, R star box is just L, which is just a sharp box. So in, co in tortoise coordinates, the ADS box becomes an ordinary box, a really sharp box. Okay. On the other hand, if you go to the horizon, if you approach the horizon, then F of R goes like 2 kappa R minus R. And then when you do the integral, you get that uh, this goes like uh, 2 kappa exponential of 2 kappa r star. So that means that uh, this limit is the same as this limit. The tortoise coordinate is infinite towards uh, negative values. Okay? So the domain of definition of this Schrodinger problem is non-compact. And you will get continuous spectrum. In fact, if you plot the effective potential, what you get in terms of the tortoise coordinate, you get a sharp wall here. The potential does that in ADS. <coughs> then you get some feature, and then you get a universal tail here because of the horizon, which goes like e to the 2 kappa r star. So the energy levels in this potential are continuous. Okay. Capital? No, this is little f which is the function that controls the metric, right? It's the function in the metric. OK, so very simple, right? Would you say the same without going through these uh, new coordinates? Uh, I don't know. I, this is the way I understand it. I don't know. Fair way. I mean, are there other ways? To, uh, Maybe, I guess so, but uh, this is the easy way, if you like. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, that depends on the spin. That depends on the angular momentum. So uh, if you have a large angular momentum, there is a tendency to get a bump here. Okay. But, uh, yeah. <coughs> anyway, uh, what do I have to do in order to discretize the spectrum by the right amount? Right? If I want to have a discrete spectrum with the right e to the minus s splitting, I need to put a wall here at the horizon, and then the spectrum gets discretized. Right? And you can ask uh, how far has to be the wall in order for the spectrum to be just right to get the finite entropy right. So to get that the average distance between levels is of order e to the minus s. And the answer is that it has to be at Planck distance, which is natural kind of answer, right? So if I now go back to the Euclidean cigar metric, Yeah? No, I don't want to. I just say that if I was so perverse, that is what we would get. I mean, the perverse person who did that was Herald Toft in the 80s. That was called the brick wall. Okay? Uh, nowadays, it's called more like the firewall or something. I mean, uh, there are many. They are not the same thing, but they are similar. Okay? What? R star goes to minus infinity, but uh, that means that uh, you are approaching the horizon. Okay? So the wall is a Planck, dist a Planck distance from the horizon. Right? And that means that uh, the cigar background is mutilated here. Right? In right, in right uh, just the right amount to get a discrete spectrum with the right spacing. 
Okay? So you could say that uh, if you, for example, have some stringy defect here in string theory, you could have some defect there, some kind of uh, structure there. Then you could account for this. But if you don't put any defect at the tip of the horizon, at the tip of the Euclidean cigar, then there is no way, even in string theory, that you will get rid of this problem. Okay? No, no, I think I mean proper distance, real distance. Okay. No, the distance to the horizon, I, if I start at the horizon, I get away a Planck distance, special, <coughs> right? If you like in the, that is a, in the uh, Rinder coordinates, uh, I have the horizon here, and it's the distance here, rho. Okay, so for rho equal Planck, if I put a wall here, then I get the right spectrum, the right order of magnitude for the spectrum. But then I am uh, blatantly uh, giving up the idea that the horizon is smooth. Okay? I'm putting something there. Okay? Call it a firewall, a stretch horizon, call it uh, whatever. All right. So uh, this is just uh, the old stuff. By the way, uh, for example, Another possibility is to say that uh, this thing is replaced by a large number of classical geometries which have also this type of topology. Fastball. And those are fastballs. Okay. So there are many, uh, there are many uh, if you like, uh, manifestations of this kind of idea. No, no. Uh, well, we don't know because they are not developed to the point that you can. I mean, something like things like the brick wall are just silly, in the sense that uh, they don't have any dynamics attached to it. It's just just to make the point that you can get the right numbers. Right? It's like. Uh, well, it's a it's a brute force kind of uh, boundary condition which doesn't have any physical content in itself, right? Uh, <coughs> the firewall is also like that, except that uh, it's introduced for subtle reasons, but it probably works in the same fashion. I don't know. The fastball is more principled, but the fastball, the fastball is not developed to the point that uh, you can see if it works for a real black hole with macroscopic entropy. Okay. What were the boundary conditions in which you got the uh, continuous spectrum? The boundary conditions in the horizon? The boundary conditions is just that I have modes that uh, go inside or go outside with fixed frequency, okay? And they just bounce, they just bounce off the infinity because there is an infinite wall. Yeah, but there is like it's finite distance, like the minus infinity is finite distance, from right? It's finite physical distance. Yes. Okay, so this is the boundary condition. Yeah. But you have modes that are going in or go modes that are going out. Those that are going in can be considered to be uh, things that you are throwing into the black hole, those that come out are the Hawking radiation. Okay? When you give them a thermal spectrum, that's the Hawking radiation. Okay, so that was the discussion about uh, why do we get these exponential tails when, do, when we do the gravity approximation. And now, uh, in the time remaining, I want to consider what can we say, just from the general properties of the uh, of the conformal field theory, what can we say about the long time correlation, the long time behavior of these correlation functions? Okay. So uh, I'm going to consider just uh, the simple case of a thermal correlation function, which is uh, enough. Uh, even to consider also the EPR correlations in the thermofield level, right? And later on, I will uh, talk about more general states, right? Because my methods will be very crude, I will be able to say a lot of things about very general states, although the answers will be a little bit simple, in the sense that uh, I will get a very general kind of behavior for everybody, okay? So the, uh, the type of, of object I'm going to look at is this one, right? And now I am in the CFT, is in a finite box, in a sphere, 
spectrum is discrete, so I can just do a spectral decomposition of this, writing it in terms of the, uh, of the energy levels. So this is just a sum, one over the uh, partition function, sum over nm, which are the indices of the energies, then uh, e to the minus beta e n b n m square e to the i e n minus e m t. Okay, so you get this thing, and then the question is, what can you say about this thing, right? Now, at times which are small compared to the Heisenberg time. So when the times are small compared to the Heisenberg time, which is <coughs> the time scale associated to uh, uh, the, uh, is the inverse of the minimal energy splitting, which is relevant for this problem, right? then I can forget about the discreteness of the spectrum. Because at times uh, much smaller than this time scale, this thing uh, can be approximated by a continuous variable. So I can replace the sum over the energies by a continuous integral. And that's the situation in which you get, for example, uh, quasi-normal behavior. You get uh, things like uh, this can be approximated by an integral over frequencies, continuous frequencies of some function that looks like a Lorentzian, for example, e to the i omega t. And this goes like e to, e to the minus lambda t. Okay? So this is the kind of behavior that you get in quantum field theory, in thermal quantum field theory when you have interactions uh, in a thermal ensemble. You get these uh, imaginary poles which are called quasi-normal poles and you can catch them in perturbation theory. You can compute them in non-perturbative uh, analysis in the gravity side. Those are the poles that uh, we were discussing just a moment ago. Okay? But in general this is a feature that appears because you have approximated the integral, the sum by an integral, okay? And then you get this kind of behavior. But this has to break down, in principle, when you get to time scales which are larger than the Heisenberg time scale, right? On the other hand, when you are uh, beyond the Heisenberg time scale, then all these uh, phases are completely random, okay? They are completely random. As t uh, changes, they just fluctuate uh, in a completely random way, okay? So that means that uh, despite the fact that this is a sum of positive quantities, you will get a lot of cancellation because of the sum over random phases. And therefore the correlation function will go down, okay? And then you can ask if it goes down to some kind of plateau, to some kind of uh, base level, okay? And the answer is yes, it goes to a base level. For example, you can, one way you can uh, analyze that is to compute the infinite time average. Take the infinite time average of this, which is defined as uh, 1 over t integral dt from 0 to t of the correlation function. Okay? So if you just go and calculate that, uh, this is just the expression that I have there with the sum e to the minus beta en bnm squared and then the time average of the of the phases but the time average of the phases is just that such that it is only non-zero uh, when the two energies coincide okay and that projects the whole thing to the diagonal elements so this is equal to one over z sum into the minus which is positive Okay, and this is a kind of thermal average of the diagonal components of the uh, of the of the operators. Okay, but uh, of course, uh, this is only a small part of the operator. So, uh, if for example I say that I renormalize my operators by subtracting the uh, the diagonals, okay, like for example, if you are given just a free field operator in quantum field theory, it doesn't even have diagonals because it only connects states with different by a particle number one. So there are no uh, diagonal expectation values for the free field. Okay? So uh, if I work with uh, subtracted operators which uh, do not have this behavior, then these tests give me zero. So it doesn't tell me anything about the answer. Right? 
It's much more interesting to look at the fluctuations that this could have. So to look at uh, the time average of the following positive quantity, you take bt, b0, you take the square of the, the modulus squared, and you time average it. Okay? Now, when you go and do this calculation, it's just trivial to do the sums. What you get is something of the following sort. You get sum, 1 over z squared, sum over now mn pq, four indices, e to the minus beta Where is this? I don't want to get it wrong. EM plus EP, and then BMN squared, BPQ squared, and then this is times e to the I T, and then is. EM minus EM mass EQ minus EP T time average now something interesting happens this thing will uh, vanish unless uh, the sum of these four energies is uh, zero okay so I have to enforce that EM minus EM plus EQ minus EP is zero and now I have two possibilities for this to happen well first of all it could be that these energies are, have rational relations between them. So it could be that there are zeros of this expression which are very uh, common. Okay? Like for example in the harmonic oscillator, basically uh, it's very easy to get this uh, to get zero because nowhere, uh, no matter where you are, you just need uh, all, the, all the levels are spaced by the same amount. Okay? So you just need to take them uh, at the distance, relevant distance to make this zero, but you can do it everywhere. But in a generic system, uh, the energies will be just irrational numbers, so uh, you will not satisfy this generically, right? And therefore, uh, there are two possibilities. Either En equal En and Ep equal Eq, or En equal Ep and En equal Eq. In this case, I'm back to the original thing, where I am concentrating only on the diagonals, and therefore, I say that it's not interesting, okay? Because I just renormalized the, the operators to give me zero here for the expectation value. And in this case, what I get is the following. I get uh, for the time average of the square of the correlation, I get 1 over z squared, the sum over m and n of e to the minus 2 beta em bmn to the 4. OK, I get that. And now I can define the, what I would call the level of noise. First of all, you see that that's positive, which means that uh, the correlation will not die. Okay? The correlation is forced not to die, so it will stay oscillating. One thing you can do is to compute now the same, but for the time derivative. You take the time derivative, right? And what you get when you do the analysis is that, roughly speaking, you get t times this. Right? So what you get is that the object is oscillating with a time scale of order the thermal time, so t to the minus 1, and it's just like a, a crazy oscillation with a very small amplitude, you will see, okay? And uh, it stays there, okay? It's like a noise. So I will define this noise to be the square root of this thing divided for normalization uh, by uh, the correlation at time 0, okay? So what you get here is uh, something that goes like the square root of uh, the sum in mn e to minus 2 beta em bmn 4 
divided by the sum in m n e to the minus beta dm dmn square square. And you see that this has the same number of b's up and down, the same number of suppression factors due to the density matrix up and down, but it has two more sums of indices uh, down than up. Okay. And because of the square root, <coughs> that means that this will be of order one over the effective number of levels for which the matrix elements of the B operator are distributed. So it's like uh, the effective number of uh, states to which the B operator talks. Right? So for example, if the B operator is a single particle operator, this N will be small because it only talks to states that are differ by one particle. Still is a big number, right? Because you have many levels, right? But uh, if uh, if BMN uh, is a more democratic operator, this this number will be bigger. Yes, that was a question. Okay. okay so now, uh, in order to continue with these estimates, I have to make some hypotheses about the form of the operators. Okay. And the, the hypothesis is uh, the so-called chaos hypothesis. Uh, or sometimes also is uh, referred to as ETH, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Okay. And this is uh, one of the possible definitions of what you mean by quantum chaos. And it's just an assumption at this level, it's just an assumption about the form of the matrix elements of the operators in such a way that that observable is going to thermalize. Okay? So you can prove that if you assume this form for the matrix elements of the operator, then time averages equal ensemble averages. So you can prove thermalization saying that uh, when, when you make the system evolve for a long time, even if it is in a pure state, the expectation values of these operators will be approximately given by the ensemble averages, canonical ensemble averages, for example. Okay? So you can prove thermalization if you make this assumption. And the assumption is uh, just to say that if you have, a, say, a band of states, which are the relevant states for the dynamics, which means that uh, you have some average energy, and uh, the state is not too dispersed, so the state is, uh, say, localized or it has support on a band of states with it, which has a, a width of order t, okay? and then in this band there must be e to the s states. Okay? So if you have such a band and you consider the matrix element of your operator in this band, <coughs> the chaotic assumption is the assumption that this matrix element is pretty democratic. Okay. And by that, what we mean? We mean that uh, if this operator doesn't commute with Hamiltonian, then the basis in which the operator diagonalizes has no correlation with the basis where the Hamiltonian uh, diagonalizes. Okay. So the two bases are rotated by a random matrix, by a random unitary matrix. Okay. That's the assumption. So, for example, let's say that uh, the basis that diagonalizes B is alpha with eigenvalues B alpha, right? And uh, then I can consider uh, the matrix that transports these bases to the basis of uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So this is summing N U N U alpha N N, where U is a random matrix. U is unitary, is in SU e to the S, so it's a unitary matrix in this subsector of the Hilbert space, and it's random. Now, how does a unitary random matrix look? How do the matrix elements look? Uh, they look as follows. Uh, because it's a unitary, uh, the sum
the sum uh, of the matrix elements uh, satisfy this. Okay, this is the definition of unitarity, right? And that means that, uh, of course, they have to be orthogonal if they correspond to diagonal terms. But the diagonal terms, you have that the sum in beta of u alpha beta <laughs> modulus squared has to be 1, right? So that means that the sum of these terms, and there are e to the s terms here, has to be 1. So the average value of the entries of the matrix has to be e to the minus s halves. Okay? That's the typical size. And then you can consider the phases random. They have to have some global constraints because they have to exactly vanish in the orthogonal parts, but uh, you can take them random because this is just one constraint per uh, e to the s terms. Yes. Yeah, it, s is just the width, I mean, the number of states, the log of the number of states in this band. So s is the logarithm of the density of states in this part of the Hilbert space. So T is the width of a band in which you can consider the density of states approximately constant or the entropy approximately constant, the log of the density of states approximately constant, okay? Sometimes, sometimes. No, this is not, uh, there's no <coughs> thermality here. Well, this is just a property of the spectrum, okay? Now, uh, if you have uh, states which are generic with a spread T in this band, and you take uh, expectation values of those states in normal, uh, uh, for normal uh, observables, you will see that they have uh, approximately the thermal form. Okay? So uh, at this level, since I'm looking at the matrix elements of the operators, I'm, I'm not saying in which state I'm, I'm, I'm working. Okay? I'm just telling you what, is the, what are the uh, energy levels of the system. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, probably you did. Uh, why does it also lead to a special unitary and not just unitary? Uh, you well, uh, it's just the matrix that diagonalizes. It's a special unitary, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the phase doesn't affect the fact that it diagonalizes. Okay, so <coughs> that means that uh, the matrix elements of B are of the form B, M, N. The matrix elements of B in the energy basis are of the form BNN, sum in alpha, U, M alpha, B alpha, U, uh, N alpha, complex conjugate. And then if you are looking at the diagonal ones, then this is the sum in alpha, B alpha, U, M alpha, modulus squared. So this is something which is of order e to the minus s halves times an average value of the eigenvalues of the operator B in this band, okay? Sorry. This is the, uh, since this is 1 over, is, is something which is goes like 1 over S, E to the S, and there are E to the S states here, this thing computes an average value of the eigenvalues of the operator in the band, okay? And since it's an average value, it will be pretty smooth as we vary the band. So if I move a little bit the band up and down, okay, this will vary very smoothly because it's an average, okay? It will smooth out the details of the spectrum, okay? However, the off-diagonal terms... with m different from n, these of diagonal terms, they will correspond uh, to just sum of random phases where I have uh, two powers of e to the minus s half, so it will be something of order e to the minus s, sum of random phases. So this is a sum from 1 to uh, e to the s of something which is uh, plus or minus 1, say. Okay. And this thing is a further the square root of the number of terms because it's like a random walk. Okay? So this will be a further e to the minus s halves. And that's uh, 
basically the statement of the ETH uh, ansatz. So uh, this was just a justification of the ETH ansatz. The ETH ansatz says that uh, in a chaotic band, so in a, in a band where you can't have the conditions for quantum chaos, your observables, or the observables that will thermalize, that will behave uh, in a natural way under thermalization, will have uh, matrix elements of the form, some uh, smooth uh, diagonal term, plus some other smooth off-diagonal term, which will be down by e to the minus s halves, and then there will be some random matrix here, some erratic faces. So this is random order one. So this is plus or minus ones. Okay? So this is the form of the TH ansatz. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So, uh, that means that the, if you plot the matrix elements of the operator, they will look like this. I mean, you make a, you have the matrix of the operator, right? It will, be look, it will look like a banded uh, matrix where the width is something that you can control by smearing the operator. Let's say that you, go, you put a bound on the energy that the operator, that the states, the energy difference that the states can have when they are connected by the operator, right? This is like a regularization. Let's say that uh, you don't want to consider uh, uh, an operator that uh, creates out of the vacuum a particle which is, uh, which is 100 GeV, okay? So I smear the operator over a region which is uh, maybe, I don't know, one electron volt inverse. And then the only states that this operator extracts from the vacuum have typical energy bounded by one electron volt. Okay? So this is a regularization. So I, I just put this operator to zero outside. right? And then the matrix elements uh, will look like a very dense band here, which as you go down in energy gets less dense. Okay. And uh, it will be pretty democratic. So the off -diagonal, there will be some diagonal terms that will be special, that are, bar are bigger. Okay? They are of order one, the diagonal terms. But off diagonal, it will be dumped by this factor. Everybody will be very small. It will be random. Okay? Random. And uh, it will, you know, the, the, uh, the number of states goes up with the energy. So the matrix looks more dense as you go up in energy. Okay? And the size of the terms goes down. So the larger the energy, the smaller. This is like a forest in which uh, here you have trees and here you have grass. Okay? And it goes like that. So that's how uh, one of these operators looks. Right? So, uh, <coughs> and with that, you can just do very simple estimates of how these things should behave. Pardon? Sorry? In the energy basis, yeah. And you're saying that the, the states up there are the high energy? Okay. Yeah, I, I put the high energy states up in the, in the upper part of the, of the... Yeah, this is just E1, E2, E3, E1, oh, okay. E1, E2, E3. Uh, and you're saying that the state up there are the high energy? Yeah, well, the other way around in the... Yeah, so e, here I, I count in this down, and here I count up. It's just a way of putting the, uh, the matrix to, sort of to make a picture. Right? <laughs> because uh, there are more energy states uh, in, the, in a given band of uh, some given width, there are more energy states normally. In normal systems, as you go up in energy, you get more levels per unit width. Okay? Entropies go up normally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if not, you have negative temperature and things like that. You could, ha you could have these things, but it's not the normal thing to have. Right? Okay, so uh, under this situation, now I can uh, make some simple estimates.
So for example, the original one, the original thermal correlator, this was a thing that was like, a, let's say that I, I, I am estimated as coming from a band. Let's say I work, uh, I take the contribution for a given band of states, OK? So I have a band of states. Again, at some characteristic energy E band, I get E to the S band states here, and the width is T. Okay? So I have uh, taking only the contribution coming from this band. right? So you have something within this band. This average is of the order of uh, E to the minus S, which is the number of states. And the sum now over everybody, Bmn squared e to the i en minus en t. At long times, beyond the Heisenberg time, these are random phases. Okay? So uh, this is e to the minus s times e to the minus s because I have two powers of b positive. And then I get a sum over two indices. So sum over 1 to e to the 2s terms, average, of plus minus 1s. And this thing is the square root of the number of terms, which is e to the s. So in general, you get e to the minus s band. So this is the level that you have of noise coming from that band. Okay? So that means that uh, the correlator will look like this. Okay, where, where this oscillation is e to the minus s of the corresponding band. And this is the Heisenberg time associated to that band, roughly. In fact, there is an interesting twist here, which is the following. Uh, if this thing decays like e to the minus lambda or gamma t, okay, you can ask at what time does this curve goes below the time average. Okay, the time average is of this sort, e to the minus s. So you can ask when the value of the correlator that gives the continuum approximation, when it goes down below that level. Okay? And then you find that... Uh, that time, which I will call the time of dip, because the continuous approximation dips below the time average, this goes like uh, beta times s, right? obviously, because e to the minus s is this level. Okay? This is exactly the page time. Okay? It's the, the time that I talked about yesterday, about uh, the evaporation, etc. But here, there's no evaporation. So this is not really the page time. It's just the same order of magnitude. But it, has, it doesn't have that interpretation. However, notice that this time is much smaller than the Heisenberg time, which is exponential in S. And therefore, at this level, it is still a good approximation to approximate the integral by a, the, the sum by an integral. So there is no reason to <coughs> expect that this curve is breaking down. Okay. So what could happen is actually that, uh, although this, I guess nobody knows it, right? What could happen is that this thing goes actually below, much below the level of the uh, of the time average, and then goes up again until the level of the time average, so that there is a ramp between the Heisenberg time and the deep time. You see? Uh, in the case uh, mentioned by Douglas this morning, uh, in the case of the spectral form factor, it's not so obvious that there should be a ramp. I mean, you have to prove that there is a ramp. Okay? Why? Because uh, if the decay is power-like, right, and the Heisenberg time is exponential in, in, uh, in uh, S, then, roughly speaking, you attain the level of the, uh, of the time average more or less at the Heisenberg time. Right? So there could be a ramp because we are not sensitive to factors of two and things like that, or to powers of the Heisenberg time. Right? We only have this exponential sensitivity in these simple estimates. There could be a ramp, but it's not that obvious. I mean, maybe there, there is, maybe there isn't. But in this case, you get good reasons to get a ramp because the correlation function is going to decay exponentially, and then if it is not breaking down here, then you have to trust these low values here, and then it should come back up, because we know that at long distances, at long, at long times, it has to oscillate with amplitude to the minus s. Okay? So this is uh, evidence for the ramp, and it should be interesting to check 
if uh, for chaotic under the assumptions of uh, quantum chaos for the operators, you can prove uh, the existence of the RAM for uh, these more, more complicated observables. Sorry? In no computation. I'm just telling you that there should be a ramp, but I didn't. Uh, because the, at this point, the, the answer that I get uh, from the assumption of continuous spectrum shouldn't break down yet, because this time is much smaller than the Heisenberg time. Okay? There's no reason to expect it to break down. Okay? But I don't have a proof. Okay? It's just that uh, it's natural to imagine that it will, it will go up in a ramp. Yeah. What operator? No, 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 no. I can. You can choose operators which are very crazy or very fine-tuned so that they don't satisfy. Yeah. Well, I think that you can choose the basics. It's easy to fire the intuitive exas. The point is that uh, normal operators that you define to measure local quantities. Uh, so what is low, normal operators? So, all the operators that thermalize, mm -hmm. all the operators that thermalize, mm -hmm. okay should have this kind of form. In fact, what you have is that in systems that thermalize, when you calculate numerically, you see that they have this form. <laughs> and if you assume they have this form, you can prove that they thermalize. Okay? But not the other way around. Okay? That's why it's called a hypothesis. It's not really a theory. Right? It's a characterization of thermalization. Yeah. He says, if the operators have this form, then these observables will thermalize. Okay? We know there are systems where there is no thermalization, like uh, many body uh, localization systems, for example. Okay? So it's not a theorem. It's not that uh, every system thermalizes uh, and for every operator and things like that. Yeah. Okay, but it's a mini RAM that you have here. You don't have much to climb. Yeah, yeah. Well, the ramp uh, is always like that because this thing is always small. Okay. In the other case, we had a, we went higher up. So. No, no, it was also small. The uh, I mean that was because the I'm starting with one here, <laughs> and uh, he was starting with uh, with uh, with a partition function. Okay. So it's um, yeah. It's okay. If, there is, if you have continuous spectrum, there is no reason for a ramp. Yeah, there is no reason to expect a ramp or anything like that. I mean, the reason why I'm saying there should be a ramp is because I know that you have to get to the level of the, th of the quantum noise. Right? And uh, this other approximation in which uh, the, uh, the correlation goes exponential shouldn't break down so early. So then there should be some type of, some type of ramp. Okay? No, no, in the black hole system, you get rigorously decaying correlation functions. If you calculate just yes, with its normal rules, using the cigar and everything. Why, why are we getting, uh, I mean, in, in spectral form, factor, we don't get the initial behavior to be powered. Why is it exponential here? Uh, well, I c you could get also uh, power law if you consider conserved quantities, like, for example, currents. Like currents tend to decay like power law. The poles associated, for example, to hydrodynamics, sound, uh, lead to power laws. And the poles associated to diffusion lead also to power laws. So if you have uh, typically currents, densities, uh, you get power laws. But if you have operators that have no particular uh, symmetry meaning, uh, you tend to get exponentials. Because you get poles which, are, which have a non-trivial imaginary part. So <coughs> Okay, so <coughs> I have a few minutes left for today, and in these few minutes, I have to uh, finish the story with which I started. Okay. So this was for one band. So I'm going to now combine the bands. Okay. So let's let's say that I have several bands. So my I will work with a density matrix now, which is the sum for several bands with some probability factors of the density matrix for each band. And the probability factors 
we sum to one. For example, the probability factor for a band, if it is canonical, if I want to simulate a canonical density matrix by bands, okay, this will be just e to the minus the free energy of the band divided by the partition function, which is the sum of all these guys over the bands. Okay? And uh, each of these terms is of the form e to the minus beta energy of the band plus the entropy <laughs> of the band divided by z. And now, then the noise level, which is this level of oscillation here, will be a sum over bands of the noise level of each band weighted by the thermodynamic probability that you are in that band, okay? which is weighted by the particular density matrix you are looking at. If it is canonical, it's just that one. Okay? And this, uh, then, you see that goes like sum in bands, and this probability is such that, so this is 1 over z, which comes out uh, of everything. And then you get e to the minus b beta e band plus s band, e to the minus s band. So chaos in the operator completely kills the entropic factor okay, for each band. And that means that uh, the noise uh, tends to be dominated by the lower bands. So if you have several bands and you have weighted them canonically, according to the canonical density matrix, then the noise is always dominated, has larger amplitude for the lower bands, irrespectively of whether those bands are dominating the thermodynamics or not. So, for example, the, uh, you could have a situation like this. You have two bands. You have the high band and the low band. Okay? And then uh, the noise, let's say that uh, T is high. That means that the partition function is well approximated by the free energy of the high band. Okay? So thermodynamics is well approximated by the high band. The lower band only gives exponentially small contributions to thermodynamic expectation values. Right? However, the noise will have a contribution from the, uh, from the high band, which will be uh, of the order of uh, <coughs> e to the minus s of the high band. And uh, the lower band will have a contribution will, which will be of the form of uh, <coughs> e to the minus beta e of the lower band times the thermodynamic suppression, which is e to the minus beta, the difference in free energies. Absolute value. Okay? So for the lower band, this thing uh, is much larger than the corresponding thing for the higher band. Okay, because the energy is lower. Okay. But you have this thermodynamic suppression. So this is the thing uh, that uh, in the picture about the uh, Ansatz of Maldacena uh, was multiplying the, uh, the, the term that goes with the graviton gas saddle point. The graviton gas saddle point is weighted by this factor here, which in the Euclidean gravity picture you see it as some difference of Euclidean actions for the two instantons. Right? This thing was completely missed because uh, the time average of the correlation function calculated in the black hole is zero, so the noise is zero. Okay? So this was replaced by a zero. Okay? And now what we have is that something non-zero here, and I have here uh, to compare these two things. Okay? So you see that the important thing is to compare this thermodynamic suppression factor with this other thermodynamic suppression factor. Okay? Because, for example, let's say that uh, in, in Jan Mills theory, you want to compute, you want to compare the graviton gas band with the black hole band. Okay? So the difference in free energies, absolute value, will be of the order of the absolute value of the black hole band, the high band. And this free energy is, if I multiply it by beta, will be of order n some constant Lt d minus 1. Right? But the entropy of the high band is always of the form n star d, d for dimension, times f times Lt d minus 1, which you can get just by uh, computing this as beta d beta minus 1 acting on beta f high. Okay? So you just 
evaluate this, and you see that the entropy is always larger in numerically, is larger by a factor of d from the absolute value of the free energy. Okay? So that means that this suppression factor is exponentially harder than this one. They are both exponential, right? but this one is much smaller because the coefficient in front uh, is larger. Okay? So that means that the thermal noise coming from the graviton gas dominates the amplitude of the noise, right? But the other one is still there. So you have like a superposition of two, uh, of two uh, trains of noise. And of course, there are also noise coming from other bands, uh, like the small graviton band, the Hagedorn phase of strings. Uh, you, know, you have all the spectrum of the theory, in principle, as predicted by holography. You can sort of do the tomography of uh, what are the different contributions to uh, this noise structure coming from all those bands. But this is one that dominates the amplitude, that gives the largest amplitude, that dominates the, you know, the overall amplitude. And that's the lower one, which is the graviton gas band. Okay? However, for example, <coughs> if you are looking at Poincaré recurrences, so if you look at uh, times of the order of the Poincaré time, so you come here, 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 very long, and then you look for a peak, <laughs> right? this peak is only contributed by the high band. Because the Poincaré recurrences of the lower band, first of all, occur on a much shorter time scales, because the energy spaces of the lower band are much higher. Okay? And at the same time, they are suppressed by this factor. So instead of being peaks of order one, they are peaks suppressed by this factor. Okay? So the peaks of order one come only from this part, from the, from the high band noise or from the black hole band noise. Okay? So you really have to keep everything inside in order to uh, obtain a complete picture of how the quantum noise behaves at very long times, right? So I think I will take it from, the, uh, from here uh, tomorrow. Uh, still talking a little bit about the noise, uh, but I can stop here. Thank you. Minus sign, what do you mean? It's like e to the negative entropy. Um, so the higher one, wouldn't that be smaller? You're saying the yeah, the, the, the numerical value of the entropy is larger than the numerical value of this free energy difference okay. by a factor of d, yes. Happens to be, yeah. And uh, that's a property which is based on conformal symmetry because conformal symmetry fixes this up to a coefficient, uh -huh. okay? And then uh, the entropy can be computed from the free energy. <laughs> So this, this, is a, this, is, this number is a, com is a consequence of conformism. So it's robust. Okay. That's okay, that number. But which term is bigger in your expression for noise? Uh, the, term big the bigger term is this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because this is the, because S is larger, the exponential yeah. suppression is much harder. Okay.